I'm hoping I, I got a ways to go here. So sometimes I get carried away and like the class and go a little long on it. But I, I, what I wanted to look at this afternoon, I wanted to look at Luke 17, chapter 20, through Luke 18, verse 8, focusing especially on the parable of the unjust judge at the end. Okay, 18, 1 to 8. That's where I'm headed. But to get there, i got to walk over some territory from 1720 because I think that's the key that we often miss in trying to understand this parable of the unjust judge. To appreciate what Jesus is teaching in this parable, I think it's necessary for us to recognize that chapter 17, verse 20, through chapter 18, verse 8, it's all one section of Scripture that consists of three units, each of which deals in some way with the coming of the kingdom of God. And when you see these connections, I think it will be uh, useful. I'm hoping this works, yes. Okay, so here are the three sections. There's this large middle unit of this one section. I'll mix up sections, but it's one section, three units. And you have this large middle unit that's made up from chapter 17, verse 22, down to chapter 17, verse 37. And that unit clearly speaks of the consummation or the finalization of the kingdom of God, that dramatic coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the kingdom that He inaugurated with His first coming will be completed or finalized, consummated. And that middle section clearly deals with that consummation or finalization. Now the first unit... Just those two verses, 17, 20 to 21, it's tied to that larger uh, middle unit. And you can see it by this phrase in verse 21, behold here or there behold. And then in the second unit, just in two verses down to 23, you have behold there or behold here. So you see the link here. So you have the large middle unit that's dealing with the consummation of Christ's return. It's tied to the first unit by this phrasing here. And then it's tied to the last unit, which is the parable we're going to look at. And you can see that by the reference in chapter 18, verse 8, when he says, when the Son of Man comes, and in verse 30, the second, when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, so you have this one section, three units, all of which are dealing with some aspect of the coming of the kingdom of God. Now the first unit, I'll just put this up here, I'm not going to read those till I get to the parable. But I want you to be able to look when I'm talking about it and say, is he crazy? What's he saying? You can kind of look over here and see. Because I put the text up there. But in the first unit, the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God was coming. So this is what they know. He's dealing with the Pharisees here in these two verses. And he tells them that the kingdom of God is not an exclusively future phenomenon. See, as their question assumes but rather the kingdom is among them. You see, the kingdom is already breaking into the world in the person and ministry of Jesus. So their question is, when is it going to come? Assuming it is an exclusively future phenomenon, and he answers them and says, no, it's not exclusively future. Because it is already occurring and being delivered and being brought in my person and in my ministry. You see, the new world is already being planted in the midst of the old. And you see many other places where Jesus makes that point. The, the kind of great and unmistakable heavenly signs that they were seeking, the Pharisees were looking at, when they said, when is the kingdom of God coming? And Jesus says, well, it's already being planted in your midst. And the kind of signs that they were looking for that they thought would mark the kingdom's, the kingdom's arrival Jesus says here, look, those signs are not associated with the kingdom's arrival, but with the kingdom's consummation, with the return. That's when you're going to see these unmistakable, undeniable, cosmic signs that you're looking for in terms of the arrival. He says, no, you know, those signs will accompany the consummation. The, there certainly are signs with the arrival of Christ's ministry. I mean, he's doing miracles. That's the import of a lot of the things that he does. That he's here showing that the, the kingdom is, is being brought in in his person and ministry, and he's casting out demons and doing miracles. So there are signs in his ministry, but they're the kind that are more susceptible to misinterpretation. He 
You see, they're more ambiguous. They're the kind that are susceptible to being rationalized away by those bent on not grasping their import. Then are the cosmic signs that will accompany his consummation, his return. There's going to be no doubt in those. You see, so when he addresses the Pharisees who assume that the kingdom is exclusively future, he tells them no. You see, the kingdom is already being planted in your midst. And then in this lengthy section, 1722 to 37, he instructs his disciples about the kingdom. But in their case, he focuses on the consummation, not the inauguration. See, the Pharisees are over here focusing on the not yet, the future. And he tells them, you're missing that it's already being ushered in. For the disciples, he focuses on the consummation. You see, that's what he does for them. He focuses on the consummation uh, because they're thinking, you know, uh, maybe all of the kingdom has been arriving here. They're the ones who are short uh, on that part of it. See, as Joel uh, Green says in his commentary, a New Testament uh, scholar, he says in his commentary, for the Pharisees, Jesus emphasizes the presence of God's project in response to their concern about its future. For these disciples, on the other hand, who might be tempted to think in terms of the full realization of the kingdom in the present as though there's nothing yet to come. You see? So they might be thinking, this is it, this is all that will be here. No, no, no. There's a future element to it. So for them, he focuses on the future climax of God's purpose. The finished shall, uh, 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 Green's quote. Jesus tells them that days are coming when they'll be longing for the consummation without experiencing it. There are going to be days where you're going to be longing for that. Green comments on, on verses 22 to 24. And he says, One of the days of the Son of Man refers to the time of the end when the Son of Man will be revealed. Consequently, Jesus is prophesying that during the coming days of distress, the disciples will hunger for the final resolution. Who has now not experienced that? Who has not experienced the longing for the final resolution? I'm looking forward to the time when there'll be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, no suffering, no hate, none of that. And so he's telling them here that this, there's, Jesus is prophesying that during the coming days of distress, the disciples will hunger for the final resolution. The disciples will long for the end in order that they may avoid the disquiet and pain of the present. Because of this, they might find reports of obscure appearances of the Son of Man alluring. You see, when he sits here and he says, days are coming when you'll desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you'll not see it. And they'll say, you look there, look here. You'll be vulnerable to that because you'll be longing for the consummation in this, in this current time of suffering and distress. So you'll be vulnerable to that kind of thing. And he says, such reports stand in contrast, though, with Jesus' assurance that the revelation of the Son of Man at the end will be anything but obscure. If somebody's telling you, no, 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 he's over here, he's over there, he's over in California working in a McDonald's, he's over here. Anybody says that, well, you know that's not the truth because it's going to be anything but obscure. He continues, he says, like lightning that lights up the whole sky so that all can see it, so prominent and pervasive will be the coming of the Son of Man. When the Lord returns to consummate the kingdom, there will be no mistaking. Okay, no mistaking it at all. Now, verse 25, he specifies that the end will not precede the Lord's suffering. On the contrary, his suffering is integral to God's plan. And then in verses 26 to 30, they teach that the Lord's coming... His being revealed, His coming, His return is being revealed. That will be analogous to the judgments meted out in the days of Noah and meted out in the days of Lot in that many people are going to be absorbed in everyday matters. They're going to be absorbed in those matters unprepared for the arrival of this cataclysmic judgment. You see, so that's, that's what He's talking about there. And then verses 31, I'm flying through this, but like I said, I'm headed for the parable. But in verses 31 to 33, they're a warning not to have a heart that's so invested in earthly possessions that on that day of Christ's return, 
one goes back for them as though they are the basis of life in the eschaton, in the end state. Can you imagine being so attached to physical things that when the Lord comes, you're turning back to go get stuff? Well, what does that say about your priorities and your connections? You see, that's the point that he's making there. That reflects the kind of identification with the present world that ends up costing one eternal life. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will keep it. Verses 34 to 35, they show that being involved in everyday pursuits, that's not the basis. Being involved in everyday pursuits is not the basis of judgment. On the contrary, the judgment at the judgment at Christ's return, uh, that will divide between two people who are engaged in the very same everyday pursuits. You've got sleeping, you have sleeping and, and grinding grain. The question is not being involved in everyday pursuits. That will not be the criterion of judgment. What will matter is one's disposition, one's commitments, one's attachments, one's loyalty. So you'll have two people involved in the very same everyday activities, one's taken, the other one's not. And so he talks about that. And then the disciples ask in verse 37 about the location of the judgment. Jesus tells them, in effect, not to worry about the location of the judgment because it will be as obvious as the location of a corpse is to vultures. Or alternatively, it will be as obvious as the location of a corpse that's being circled by vultures. But you don't need to worry about it. That's going to be obvious. It's going to be obvious. All right, the third unit of this section, which is where I'm at, Okay? All of that I have to walk over so you see kind of the flow of it. I know that was fast. But I want to, it's important to see that the final section is 18, 1 to 8. I'm going to read this. He says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow is causing me trouble, you see up here it's the ESV modified. I've changed some things in here, and I'll explain them when I go through. They're in brackets. He says, This widow is causing me trouble. I will give her justice, lest by coming she may blacken my eye in the end. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night, even though he delays over them? I tell you, he will give, them, he will give justice to them suddenly. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? Will he find the faith on earth? All right, the unifying theme, as I, I've tried to stress, the unifying theme of the entire section, 1720 to 188, is the coming of the kingdom of God. And in that lengthy middle section, 20, verses 22 to, to 37 of, of 17, Jesus instructs the disciples about the consummation of the kingdom at his return. When what he initiated, what he inaugurated with his first coming is going to be finalized or consummated. So he instructs them about that, and he tells them that they're going to experience a time when they long for the consummation. They're going to experience a time when they're living in this world and longing for the finish line. Longing for Christ's return. Longing for that state where there'll be no crying, no tears, suffering, mourning, pain, death, sin, any of that. That they'll be longing for that. So much so they're going to be vulnerable to false reports of its having occurred. As if he's over here, he's over there. Because your longing for that is going to be so great. You're going to be vulnerable to that. Now the parable is part of his continuing instruction to his disciples about his return as shown by the reference to his coming in verse 8. But when the Son of Man comes... You see, we often pull this out and just take about some kind of general statement about prayer. It's not just about prayer. It's about prayer in the context of the consummation of the kingdom. You see, and that changes how you see what Jesus is telling us and what he's teaching us. Luke 18, 1, it says that the upshot of the parable. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So we get it. This is the upshot of the parable. That they ought always pray and not lose heart. 
and as a New Testament scholar, a fellow named Claudine Snodgrass says in his just wonderful book, Stories with Intent, it's a book on uh, parables. But he says, Luke's concern in 18.1 is not prayer in general, but praying and not becoming weary or giving up with respect to the eschaton, the time when deliverance comes. Eschaton just means the end state. Not growing weary in terms of the end state. You see, the eschaton, when deliverance comes, the injunction to pray and not give up derives its significance from the context of the whole eschatological discourse which began in 1720. You see, it's all three units, one section, and that colors how you understand what Jesus is saying. So this is this is very important. Now, as I'll explain, okay, we're good. So I'll explain uh, uh, more fully the point of the parable. Okay, the point of the parable is that as they long for the consummation without seeing it, as you see in 1722, as they long for the consummation without seeing it, they must never lose the heart to keep praying. They must never lose their expectation that God will indeed answer their pleas and vindicate them. You and I live in a world where we walk and live in God and serve Christ. If this is all a joke, then we're to be pitied more than all men. But it's not. And so we pray for the dead. We pray for the consummation as we live in this world, as our children get cancer, get run over by cars, endure all this. As we suffer physically, we pray, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, you see. And that's the point is that as we long for the consummation without seeing it. You see, as that goes on, we must never lose heart to keep praying. We must never become so discouraged that we start to think it's not real and it's not going to happen. It's happening. It's happening. And he's saying, you hold on and you keep praying and you keep believing and you keep believing that you're going to be vindicated. And you keep praying. Now the parable is about a judge who chose repeatedly to deny justice to a widow. I just want to make sure I had the right slide up there. He chose repeatedly to deny justice to a widow uh, to ignore her valid claim. Her repeated appeals were causing him some kind of trouble. She's bringing this case. She has a valid claim. He chooses to ignore them. And her repeated appeals are calling, causing him some kind of trouble so he decides he'd better do the right thing uh, out of concern that her efforts ultimately would shame him. Ultimately would blacken his reputation. You see, rather than merely being bothered by her appeals as it's often uh, proposed and translated, that he's just getting tired of her. I don't think that's right at all. Rather than just being bothered by her appeals, I and many others understand verse 5 to say that her efforts are causing him some kind of unspecified trouble. You see, and for some reason, he wants to sweep her valid, legitimate claim under the rug, but her persistence is drawing increasing attention to his corruption. So it's drawing this attention to his corruption is going to damage his reputation. Now the word in verse 5 that's most often translated make weary or wear out, it literally means to blacken one's eye. That's why I put it in the brackets. Okay, but the question is, what is the metaphorical meaning of that? When it says literally to blacken one's eye, what's the metaphorical meaning? Now, many scholars are convinced, and I agree with them, that the metaphorical meaning here is not wearing the guy out. It's not wearing him out, wearying him, but it's shaming him. It's damaging his reputation. Now, some people, as David Crump says in his book, Knocking on Heaven's Door, uh, subtitled The Theology of Petitionary Prayer, he says here that, he says, some object to this translation or to this understanding of the metaphorical meaning of blackening one's eye, because he translates, just puts it in there, shaming. And he says, okay, some object to this translation on the grounds of the judge's disregard for men. He says he doesn't care about people. Verses 18.2 and 18.4. He says, claiming that this entails a lack of interest in what others think of him. But it's showing disregard for others. 
the judge's demeanor in 18.2 and 4 hours quite different from others showing disregard for you. Right? I mean, I don't care about lawyers, but I do care if they're going to hold me up and look at me as somebody who's been shamed, somebody who's doing something wrong. I don't want you thinking poorly of me, but frankly, uh, what I think of you and how I treat you is a different kettle of fish. So I don't think that cuts against understanding it that way. You see, I don't think it, I don't think it cuts against understanding that way. And then in verse 6, back here, verse 6, you see, it says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. He calls attention to the fact that the unrighteous judge says what? He will grant the woman justice. You see in verse 5, he says, Yet this widow is causing me trouble. I will give her justice. And so Jesus calls the text there. He says, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. Hear what the unrighteous judge says. He then asks in essence in verse 7, Jesus says, and he asks this question in verse 7, in essence meaning, if despite a delay, this unjust, this unjust, self-centered judge grants justice to a person he cares nothing about. Okay? If despite that delay, this self-centered, unjust judge grants justice to a person he cares nothing about, will not the righteous God, despite a delay, grant justice? To his blessed elect? If this clown, this guy, this unrighteous, self-centered guy is going to wind up granting justice after a delay, will not the righteous God, after a delay, grant justice to his elect? Right? I mean, this involved now, I, I don't know sometimes how much to go in the weeds, but the way I'm, I'm wired is, I, you know, you want to know, there's a conjunction here, Taking it that way involves taking this conjunction as what's called a concessive, which means instead of and, I'm going to translate it even though. You say, is that valid? Yes, it is valid. Okay, that's how it's translated in the King James, New King James, New Jerusalem Bible. That's one of the ranges of that conjunction. Okay, and I think that's the right one. Then it involves me taking this other word here and understanding it in the sense of delays. Okay, is that legitimate? Yes, it is. That's how it's translated in the Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, New America, New Jerusalem, and English Standard. <clears throat> okay, so I think that's the right sense of it. Where it says here, even though he delays over them. Do I need to lower this? I don't even know if I know how to do this. <laughs> oh, turn it down. <laughs> okay. Right, so, so, I mean, that's what I think is... is is going on. Let me read to you. This is where a lengthy quote David Crump from his book, They're Knocking on Heaven's Door. But I think it's worth it. He says, The unjust judge initially ignores the widow's pleas, procrastinates for a considerable period, and then finally acts only to preserve his public reputation. In this regard, he's unlike our heavenly judge, who always hears our request and never ignores a disciple's cries, even though he too may delay inexplicably. This characteristic of divine slowness follows a long-standing Old Testament tradition in which God's purposes, though deliberate and assured, often unfold at a, at a tortoise-like pace. At least it can feel that way to us, right? I mean, we've been studying the Old Testament. You see what's he doing with Israel? We're moving in centuries, right? But we're moving very slowly. But we're moving at God's pace. Deliver. God has his purposes. He continues, he says, the lament psalms are replete with cries of faithful men and women who trust in God's promises, but nevertheless find their faith stretched to the breaking point by God's apparent lack of interest. I mean, this is crying out for you're struggling, you're suffering, you're in this overlap of ages longing for the consummation, and you're going, hey, what? Right? Well, you see it all in the Psalms. And he quotes Psalm 40, 42, 9 and 10, 44, 23, 24, verse 26. These are faithful people who continue to pray despite heaven's doors seeming to be tightly shut against them. Eventually, the wicked begin to malign God's character since by all appearances, his inaction is decidedly faithless. God's frequent reply is that he will eventually act 
And when he does, it will be both to redeem his people and vindicate the honor of his name. Citation. Nevertheless, his timing is his own and will neither be stretched nor forcibly abbreviated by any considerations other than his own. The great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob remains forever committed to the honor and glory due his holiness. And when the time is right, he will ensure that every divine action is praised as faithful and just. See, I think this, this is something that's, that's very important. Again, the question of verse 7. The question of verse 7 is, in essence, if despite a delay, the unjust, self-centered judge grants justice to a person he cares nothing about, will not the righteous God, despite a delay, grant justice to his blessed elect? That's the question. And the assumed answer is, of course he will. If this guy does it, Hear what, the, hear what the unrighteous judge says. I will give her justice. If he gives justice, if he vindicates her cause, then can't we trust in the righteous God, even though there's a delay, that he will do so? You see, that he will, he will do that? The, the, the assumed answer is yes. But then Jesus spells out the answer. In the first part of, of verse 8, where he says, I tell you, he will give, he will give justice to them suddenly. He will give justice to them suddenly. Now this involves, I put that in brackets because this involves taking this phrase here that more commonly means soon, but it can mean suddenly. And as Snodgrass points out, he says, Luke seems to have suddenly in mind. In 1726 to 37, the message is that the coming of the Son of Man will be as it was with Noah and Lot. People were going about their daily routines and suddenly destruction came. So I think that that meaning, that aspect of the, of the phrase is what's mean, meant here. That when God pulls the trigger when it's time, it's going to happen quickly. So that's what I think he's talking about. The point is not that the Son of Man will return soon after a short lapse of time, but that when he does return, the events that are involved in that return will transpire suddenly or quickly. That's what I think he's talking about. Now, the second part of eight, almost through. In case any of you are planning to shoot yourself. Almost through. Second part of verse 8 says, Jesus asked, asked whether when he returns, he will find on earth the faith. Whether he will find people who during his absence, during his absence, have not given up their expectation of vindication, their conviction of the reality of the gospel and the truth of God, and cease praying. When I come back, will I find that people have not given up the faith? And it's a rhetorical question that serves as an exhortation to steadfastness while awaiting his return. But when he sits here and says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith? Well, that's the thing. You need to be faithful. As you have this delay, you and I need to cling to the truth and the hope that He's returning. He will vindicate us. He is ushering, consummating the kingdom where there will be that perfect eternal state where you and I will dwell forever in resurrection bodies in a perfect reality where there's no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, no suffering, no sin. None of that. And we will live forever in that. And that's the promise of God. As sure as I'm standing here, I'm telling you that's the promise of God. And so that's what he's talking about here. When I return, when I find that you've held through all the darkness, all the time, all the suffering, all the times when you're being tempted to doubt that this is real, have I found that you're holding to me and praying for that vindication on that day? That's what I think the Lord's talking about. Let me end with just two quotes. The first one is by Daryl Bach. He's a New Testament scholar. This is what he wrote in his commentary. This is Bach. He's a, this is from his commentary. He says, The context indicates that the Son of Man will be looking for those who are looking for Him. In the interim, will believers keep the faith? Will they continue to pray and look for vindication? Even though Jesus expresses the idea as a question, He's exhorting them to keep watching. It's point I made. You see, that that's what it is. It's a question, but it's really an exhortation to us. Hold the faith. You keep it. Now here's David Crump. Last one. No, I can't click it. i got to go over here. Now, Krupp says, Luke's Jesus warned his disciples, the time is coming 
When you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man that you will not see in 1722. Throughout the ages, the faithful have cried out, Maranatha, come Lord, come. For centuries, the saints have patiently raised their eyes to heaven while enduring the persecutions of Nero and execution under Chairman Mao. Whether living through the brutality of Domitian, Trajan, Lenin, Stalin, Pol Pot, or some unnamed tyrant yet to come, God's faithful people have always set their eyes on Jesus, refusing to surrender their belief in the value of prayer, the reality of God's answers, or the certainty of their eventual deliverance. That is, that's us. As we live, waiting for that. Whatever's happening in this world, you and I long for that, and we pray for that, and we keep that faith. And when the Lord comes, He'll find us. You'll find us. I'm through. Away we go. Anybody that has any needs, uh, if you need prayers or anything, you come on up, tell us. We'll pray together. Uh, but that's all I've got to say on this. Thanks.